You're listening to the Bluffton Bible Cast, a podcast designed to accompany and encourage you as you explore this week's Bible reading. Hi, everyone. My name is Doug Gerber, and I'm here with Ashley Nuenswander, Sarah Fichter, and Joe Lehman. William Fichter is our tech guy today. This week, as we read, we'll be finishing Genesis. I think we can all agree it's been an adventure. Starting with God's creation of the universe, we followed His plan for humanity. We witnessed godly people making wise choices, but also we've repeatedly seen the pain and suffering caused by the unimaginably poor choices made by many of the patriarchs. We will begin on Monday in Genesis 48, which is an account of the final conversation between Jacob and Joseph. Jacob elevates Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's sons, to be the same level as his own sons. Verse 21 is key with Jacob saying, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Jacob foretold the Exodus. Tuesday's reading in Genesis 49 requires careful study in order to capture the meaning. Jacob calls all his sons together right before he dies and places prophecies on each one. Judah, his fourth son, is chosen for the lineage that would include Jesus. Keep listening because Joe will take us deeper into this scene in Genesis 49. Finally, chapter 50 tells us the story about Joseph and his brothers burying their father back in the land of Canaan. After returning to Egypt, Joseph officially forgives his brothers again. And I think that verse 20 is the key. In that verse, he says, Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. This leads us to Thursday's reading in Matthew 18, in which Jesus tells the parable of the unforgiving debtor. And we'll finish the week by reading the eighth chapter of Romans, which concerns the constant battle between the flesh and the spirit so well portrayed in the stories of Genesis. Joseph's life was a testimony to the truth, spoken in verse 28, that for a godly person, every event, good or bad, will work toward the ultimate good of God's kingdom. It seems the main concept in our Old Testament reading this week is blessing. Ashley, can you think of a few examples of how we here in our culture throw around forms of this word? Well, I guess the obvious one is bless you when someone sneezes. Or maybe you'll hear people express how blessed they are when they're referring to material possessions or family connections. Well, we really just use this word casually, don't we? We do. I caught myself saying it often since I started researching this topic. Can you tell us about what you found? Yeah, well, to be honest, this topic threw me into the weeds. I searched article after article trying to get a grasp on why blessings held such power in the Bible. And instead, I found myself feeling frustrated and having dozens of questions. I wondered things like this. Why did Noah withhold blessing from his grandson Canaan for his father Ham's impropriety? Or how could Joseph deceive his father Isaac by wearing goat skin and actually receive the blessing ahead of his older brother Esau? And in this week's reading... How could Jacob bless the two sons of Joseph at the exclusion of his other grandchildren? Obviously, all these examples seem unfair from my worldview, but even more than that, I was completely struck by how much prophetic power these patriarchs seem to hold. Maybe it would be helpful to provide a definition of the word blessing. Yeah, good idea. Here's the expository Bible dictionary's definition. First, a blessing was a public declaration of a favored status with God. Secondly, the blessing endowed power for prosperity and success. Well, it's no wonder blessing held such power and authority in the Bible. Right. I also learned that many of the blessings in Genesis came straight from the mouth of God. When humans spoke the blessing, like Jacob in this week's reading, it was powerful strictly because God had already confirmed it in the past, often to generations before. In addition to that, although God's blessings were always effective, it did hinge on human obedience in order to become active. An example of this would be Adam's and Eve's rejection of God's blessing in the garden. Wow, that's powerful. So how did you reconcile your personal questions this week? I didn't. It seems when we allow ourselves to really think about different concepts in the Bible, we run the risk of finding ourselves with more questions than answers. And that's where I was this week. So I'm reminding myself that I'm not living in ancient biblical times and will never fully understand its nuances. And that's okay. Most importantly, these winding paths and rabbit trails, just like the blessings of the patriarchs passed down from generation to generation, lead us all directly to Jesus. And that's where I'm laying my unanswered questions this week.
One of our favorite things to do on the Biblecast is to talk about how the Old Testament points towards Jesus, the Messiah. And this week, we get the chance to do that again. Really? So where can we find Jesus in this week's Torah reading? I'm thinking about Genesis 49, 8 through 12, where Jacob blesses his son Judah. Oh yeah, Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, right? That's right. And we're learning that the lineage of Jesus is important because it connects him to the important prophecies in the Old Testament, and it connects him to the people who received blessings through covenants with Yahweh, the God of the Bible. I'm talking about Noah and Abraham and David. Okay, I'm looking at Judah's blessing, and it's pretty confusing. Jacob says he's like a lion, and there's some poetry about a donkey and some wine. What's going on here? Yeah, fair point, Doug. The entire chapter is poetry, and the imagery can be quite confusing, even for scholars. As I was doing research on these five verses, I found some scholars who believed that this is like a poetic allusion to the Messiah, and others don't believe that. One Stanford scholar named Edwin Good wrote about how this blessing that Jacob gives to Judah is just a reflection on Judah's past with his antics with Tamar and the different things that he did to Joseph. So uh, if these verses do refer to Jesus, what's the connection? Okay, I'll tell you where the touch points are, but first I want to put us in the right frame of mind. Remember back in Genesis 3 when God curses the serpent? He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is an allusion to the Messiah, and it's a famous one. However, notice how metaphoric and vague the language is. Our Messiah prophecy in Judah, Judah's blessing here in Genesis 49, is the same way. Notice how Jacob compares Judah with a lion. This is the origin of the phrase, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who has conquered in Revelation 5. Yeah, that does remind me of Jesus. Also, it says in Genesis 49.10, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. He to whom it belongs, this is referring to Jesus, Judah's tribe will be the ruling tribe of Israel through David until the Messiah comes and rules all the nations. Finally, take notice of verse 11. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in blood of grapes. Does this remind you of any New Testament passages? Right, yeah. I'm thinking of communion, wine, and Jesus' blood on the cross. There's also that passage in Revelation 19 where the nations are conquered by a mounted figure whose robe is soaked in blood. Yeah, those are the connections. Okay, Ashley, we have a couple of New Testament readings this week. A parable in Matthew and then Romans 8. Yeah, Romans 8. Ooh, We could do a whole episode on just that chapter. Seriously. Can you give us a starting point to tether the reading segments together? Yes. Let's talk about forgiveness. In Genesis 50, after their father Jacob dies, Joseph's brothers fear that Joseph will harm them now that their father is no longer in the picture. They approach Joseph with their concerns and beg his forgiveness. Can you believe Joseph actually weeps when they ask him this? Because he is so sorrowful that they would be suspicious of him. Joseph answers, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Wow, that is some forgiveness. I mean, Joseph's brothers basically sent him to his death. And just think of all the trials Joseph suffered during his time in Egypt. Yes, I know. I just think it is a good connection to our New Testament readings. I mean, in Matthew, we can see the contrast between someone who forgives easily and one who does not. One forgives like Jesus did, and the other forgoes his example completely. It's not like forgiveness is a choice. Jesus actually commands it in verse 22 of this reading. And if we do not forgive, Hebrews reminds us how easily it is for bitterness to root in our hearts. It says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Not only is unforgiveness a sin, but it can sure breed more sin in our lives. Mm, Yeah. The story of Joseph really could have looked differently if he would have held on to that hurt, huh? 
But man, that forgiveness doesn't come naturally, does it? It sure doesn't. Enter Romans 8. Let's talk about this. Lots to talk about. Let's focus on the first several verses which depict a war waging within us, a war between the spirit and the flesh. All of us would be controlled by our sinful natures if Jesus had not offered us a way out. Once we have said yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit infiltrates our lives, and we will want to continue following him, because as verse 6 says, his way brings life and peace. When the Holy Spirit is living and active in us, we will be empowered to serve God and do his will. We will be empowered to forgive, like Joseph, even when it seems impossible and even when it cuts against our fleshly pride to do so. Well, it seems we've come full circle. And I guess one way we can really tap into Holy Spirit's power is by doing exactly what we are trying to do now. Dig into his word and pray for hearts that are sensitive to Holy Spirit's leading. Thanks for listening to the Bluffton Biblecast. We pray that our listeners will become eager Bible readers as well. We're taking a two-week break, but we'll be back right after Easter to begin exploring the great adventure of the Hebrews' exodus from Egypt. Enjoy your week in God's Word.